Okay, I think we'll just uh, start the ball rolling. First off, uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Aslam. Um, so I'm the uh, club president for the Singapore Alumni Club. I'm very, very happy to be here today to host a session for my dear friend, uh, Peter Williams. And, uh, but before we start, a uh, very warm welcome. Thank you all for uh, signing up and for you know, joining us this evening. Uh, we have a very good number here. I think we have, we're showing about 40 attendees uh, who are in this webinar. Um, just a quick uh, admin before we start. Basically, we're going to have, we're going to keep it very light, very conversational uh, and easy pace. Peter will be sharing uh, his story, how he came about to write this book. Um, in the beginning, uh, we will just have a webinar, make it like a webinar style. Peter will share, I'll have I'll ask a few questions. After that, we'll be promoting everyone into a panel so that you can see you, you can see us, and you can ask questions directly to Peter. But nonetheless, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the group chat. Uh, there is a chat function in Zoom, just post it there and uh, you know we'll try our best to call out some of your questions uh, as we go along. So without further ado, I would like to first uh, introduce uh, Peter. Uh, Peter Williams, my dear friend from AXP9. Uh, he's the business treasury head, institutional clients group for Apex City Treasury. Peter has developed an international career in finance, investments, banking, and treasury, starting in Australia, continuing to London, followed by Singapore, and for the past 10 years in Hong Kong. Peter's focus in the current role is to help the firm optimize the balance sheet and create value for clients whilst navigating the regulatory environment. Peter is the author of Productive Accidents, a playbook for personal and professional adventure. Parallel to his global career in finance, he's a very proud father of four dynamic children. He's a speaker, a serial volunteer, a board member at Music for Life International and Resolve Foundation. He's also active across various sports, including bicycle, motocross, BMX, skateboarding, tennis, and golf. Peter completed his Chicago Booth MBA when he was based in Singapore with uh, AXP9. Uh, and just a big shout out to all the AXP9s in this group. I see a few familiar face uh, names that in the, in the attendees. Uh, AXP9 is celebrating their 10th anniversary this year. He relocated to Hong Kong in 2010 and started playing with the concept of productive accidents. He discovered that the productive accident framework for innovation can also turn your personal life and professional life into an adventure. His book captures 10 actionable insights that can be applied by anyone, anywhere powered by the core ingredients of curiosity and a willingness to constantly connect and collaborate. So with that, uh, let's all welcome Peter. Peter, perhaps you, you can start Thank by you, you sharing uh, how did you embark on this amazing journey? Uh, and if you have anything to share with us, slides perhaps, uh, we, we love, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, if Lenora, if you want to put up the slides, just so that can prompt some of the conversations. But you know, like the good thing is we're all familiar with the Chicago Booth program because we, we've lived it and breathed it and so on. And that's where I guess some of this story starts, right? Aslam and I actually traveled to Chicago together to kick off uh, the kickoff week back in uh, June 2008. And because we landed in the morning, we decided we were going to walk all day and, and try to adjust to the time zone through just by staying alert and going to visit uh, Sears Tower and walk you know through uh you know the, the big silver chrome beam uh the beam in, in the park there and, and go and check out some of the the scenes and then i remember we went to uh, a restaurant that i don't know trip advisor or something was recommending it's three guys and we could not get through one of the chicago deep dish pizzas which is kind of bizarre because we were starving and we couldn't get through one of them and it wasn't that big uh, so that's one of the memories. And then I remember getting tickets to go to watch uh, the Cubs versus the White Sox uh, and, uh, you know, trying to make the most of it. That was actually my first trip to the U.S. ever. All of my trip up until then was from Australia 
into Europe, into London, into Asia, etc. And you know, I went into the program um, not with any particular goal. It was more about look, I want to kickstart my brain again. I've been doing the, this role in Singapore for a while. We've been living there. Uh, we went in there for two years. But we ended up staying there for nine. Um, we went in with a three-year-old. We came out with three extra children, and it was like, okay, we've graduated. Let's get the hell out of here before we, you know, before it keeps on going. And we moved to Hong Kong. Um, but I literally went into the program thinking, look, it's eighty percent about the content. I'm sure the network's going to be good too. You know, let's say that's twenty percent. Halfway through, it was fifty-fifty. By the end of it, I think it's ninety-nine percent network because you can't remember all the content, but you know the people that are good at certain, you know, different skill sets. And you know who to contact when you want to go deeper into some topic. Um, but out of all of that program, probably the one that resonated the, the most with me, and that's part of the reason why we're talking today, is you know the research of Ron Burt and um, the fact that uh, he had done this research into how innovation happens. And you know he, he'd gone back and he'd looked at people like Henry Ford and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and everyone in between. And he tried to work out what are the common denominators, I guess, of their creativity, their innovation, et cetera. Because, you know, with hindsight, people might say, oh, you know, they were geniuses. But in real time, obviously, it's, it's, a, different, uh, it's a different situation. In real time, it's just like us right now. You know, what have we got in front of us? What can make us be creative and innovative? Um, and what I liked about it is that he broke people down based on, I guess, their willingness to build a diverse network, you know, the closed network, which is... You know, I think of people that go to work and all they do is hang around their cubicle. They might meet people in their department, their function, their company, their industry. You know, great for executing and optimizing, but, you know, not that uh, effective if you ask somebody in a closed network to reinvent their industry. Uh, contrast that to somebody that literally deliberately builds bridges between unrelated industries and they get the benefit of, you know, a competitive advantage in some ways of seeing something that's routine in one industry that if you twist it a little bit, it can be revolutionary somewhere else. And so that's where a lot of the magic happens. And you know, the example I always quote is Steve Jobs dropping in on Xerox. Xerox I think they had an R&D department and you know, they developed this little device where you wiggle it and it makes a cursor move on a computer, but they didn't know what to do with it. But Steve Jobs was like, you know, that'd be good in my garage. You know, suddenly people don't need to do coding to make their computer work. They can click on icons and you know, a child could do that. Um, you know, or he dropped out of university, but he dropped into calligraphy class. And you think, well, what's that got to do with anything? But that became a competitive advantage. You know, type font designers suddenly embraced the Mac and it got this sort of cult following and became a key differentiator and things like that. And, and so what I liked about the, the work of Ron is that he boiled all of that research down into a single phrase, which is put yourself at risk of productive accident. And, um, What's amazing about that is it's sort of, there's no guarantees, right? You're putting yourself at risk. You know, you're being alert to different opportunities that put you in some ways outside of your comfort zone. And eventually you kind of get comfortable outside your comfort zone, which sounds kind of contradictory, but it, it's sort of true in my experience. So when I moved to Hong Kong, I thought, okay, formal study is kind of over. But, you know, I'm still interested in lifelong learning and curiosity and, and so on. What are the other ways I can learn? And I quickly discovered that there's an active TEDx community in Hong Kong. And so um, I went to, you know, one of those events and um, met some people that were involved in um, startups and, and various other things and quickly realized again that there's a big overlap between people that are um, doing in that startup community, grassroots sort of startup community and attending TEDx and platforms like that. And um, one of the first people I met was, um, was a, a two guys that were running a thing called Hong Kong Startups. And they were sort of, you know, the, the whole startup scene was, was building momentum. I think there were three co-working spaces at the time. Now there's about a hundred. And then um, I got invited to some of their events. And then I started um, going to a, a platform called uh, General Assembly, which was out of New York and it was kind of, uh, it was like night school for startups. And, you know, initially they were doing one event per month and it was, just, you know, once a fortnight, then every week and then every night. And that sort of accelerated some of my connections and my network. Uh, then, you know, that became an invitation to mentor some startups. Uh, then I discovered AngelVest Group, which is like 
people that have day jobs, but they, they want to, you know, look at the pitch decks of, um, of, uh, of new startups and either maybe, you know, invest in those or mentor those, et cetera. Uh, and that became a, a good case study in, you know, seeing 20 different pitch decks every month or more and voting on them, you get points and you allocate them, you know, three points, two points or one point, and you ag they aggregate these points and the highest number will come in and physically pitch, you know, once a month. And you get pretty quick at assessing, you know, the, the good business ideas, which again, we learned during the program through the new venture challenge. Um, I got so interested in, you know, the, the whole entre entrepreneurial scene that I went back to Chicago and did two electives. So I did uh, entrepreneurial finance, entrepreneurial marketing, and they were both helpful um, for my, you know, conversations with founder, founders and everyone else. Um, the other thing, I'm just trying to check. Lenora, can you please show the slides? It's not popping up on mine. I don't know if it is for everybody else, uh, but if you can control that, that would be great. The, um, the next group I kind of discovered was um, a group called Creative Mornings. And that's another community of, of people that are doing interesting things and mainly designers, architects, advertising people. It's in 200 cities worldwide. Um, I was helping uh, to fund a documentary uh, that another contact, another productive accident sort of emerged. Um, and it led to them doing a roadshow of this documentary. And one of the, the, the words for that month was action. And they said, okay, lights, camera, action, um, come in. And it's one Friday per month. And um, I went into this room and I thought, you know, there's a hundred people in here and I don't recognize anyone. And I found that sort of interesting, the fact that we're living in the same city um, the network was quite diverse, but I, here's, here's a group that I'd never even met before. And um, ever since then, I've been going to Creative Mornings. And actually in February, I presented, which was kind of like a spoken word version of the book. It helped me accelerate my writing process. I, I find you know, one example of, of how do you apply the idea of productive accidents is if you get invited to speak at an event that's unrelated to your industry, you know, some people might say, well, no, why would you want to do that? That sounds irrelevant. But for me, I would say yes, because I'm more likely to learn something new at that event. And they're probably more likely to earn, learn something um, about, you know, from me that they, they've never sort of experienced before. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't sure where this journey into productive accidents was going to go. Um, but one of the first case studies, it was probably the most uh, directly, uh, most, most blatant, I guess, example of productive accidents was I joined a sporting uh, club here called Ladies Recreation Club. I joined the tennis team, and the they actually invited me to be the captain of one of the teams. And you know, my first reaction was, you know, maybe, uh, you know, why would I want to do that? It sounds like a bunch of admin. But I, before I made the decision, I paused and I thought, look, I've got this filter of put yourself at risk of productive accidents in my mind. What if I learn a little bit more about that first? Um, and so it turns out that this team had 40 guys, you know, fresh grads out of university, right up to retired partners at law firms, investment firms, lots of different nationalities, lots of different industries. Um, you know, there has to be something interesting that happens in, in that uh, group of people. And um, I, I accepted the role. And the, one of the first things I did, because I was new to the club, was, look, I want to get to know you guys. Um, I sent them a, an email survey just with a bunch of questions like, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Do you have any children? Where do they go to school? Maybe my children know yours. I was just looking for some sort of overlap. And um, ultimately I said, look, we're playing in this tennis competition that's coming up and we want to win. You know, tell me your number one tip on how to win a tennis game. You know, we're going to be at the baseline or at the net or, or whatever. Uh, and then the last question was kind of just a throwaway question, but it ended up being where some magic started to happen. Um, I just said, look, tell me something interesting about yourself, fun fact, something like that. And, and that's where, you know, we started to find overlaps and shared interests. So one guy came back and said, look, after 20 years of investment banking, um, you know, during the financial crisis, decided to pull the pin and, you know, go uh, full time into doing property de development in uh, Niseko. And I was like, you know, what is Niseko? And he said, look, it's powder snow heaven. And you know, I just went, you know, northern, northern island of, um, of, of, of Japan in Hokkaido. And, you know, in my mind, I'm going, well, look, I grew up on a BMX bike and a skateboard, always wanted to switch to snowboarding at some stage. 
but never really had the opportunity. Didn't bother going in Australia because conditions aren't that great there. Singapore, not a lot of snow. Um, so I thought this is a good opportunity to, you know, to get access to a place that someone knows really well. And he gave us meets rates and, you know, access to his car. And so that was, I think, Easter 2012. And we had a great experience. And the following year, we went back. The following year, he and his wife created a summer camp for children. And they invited our eldest daughter, who was 15 at the time, to be an intern. And um, I thought, well, you know, maybe that opportunity would not have happened unless I embraced this idea of being captain of the tennis team. So something unexpected happened. Any serendipity, anything, any useful outcome, happenstance or whatever is what I think of as productive accidents. And so we thought, well, our daughter's going there for the summer. We should check it out. And within a week, we realized that summer's better than winter. You know, you, you've suddenly got, you know, winter is pretty one dimensional. You've got snow, snow and snow. You go there in summer and suddenly you've got access to golf and whitewater rafting and camping and mountain biking and great food and people from around the world. And within a week, my wife and I decided, well, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could buy some land here and maybe, you know, build a house. Fast forward a couple of years later, we were literally neighbors to my tennis um, partner, the guy that originally responded to that email. And, you know, it's turned in, into this adventure, literally, where my wife, who, who works uh, at PIMCO, she can go and work out of, uh, out of Japan all of July and part of August while the kids are on summer holidays. We even have worked out how to navigate how to take our dog across there, which is not straightforward, but, you know, it's worth it. I go in there middle of July and I have a week of nonstop action, you know, golf in the morning, mountain bike in the afternoon for seven days straight, different activities every, every time. Uh, and then we sort of reverse engineer, you know, some magic by both going and working out of Tokyo. I'm paying for myself, which makes it easy for my boss to apply, uh, to, to, to approve, you know, that trip. My wife is getting the work covered because she needs to be there. Right? It's kind of optional for me. Um, and we have this amazing, you know, work experience in Tokyo. And Tokyo is a different universe, you know, and it's one of the best cities out there because it's so different. Um, but we get to meet colleagues in person, which takes our you know, working relationship to a deeper level. Um, we get to socialize. I get to take my electric skateboard and commute to work, which is, is which is fun. And um, that weekend, you know, the following weekend just happens to bump up against the Fuji Rock Festival, which is a th three day outdoor camping festival. Um, people from all over the world and, you know, you're camping with, I don't know how many people, 50,000 people, and you're seeing some of the best bands and there's great food and you know, we've camped with our, our daughters and, and other friends and family. So for the last three years in a row, this year obviously was was cancelled because of COVID. But, you know, that whole experience is, you know, I'm never going to regret taking that opportunity to, to work out of Tokyo and go to these music festivals. Um, and it's just one example of how, you know, putting myself at risk of just becoming captain of that tennis team and just being open minded led to this chain reaction of adventures that keep on getting better. So Fast forward um, last year, uh, you know, and through the program, we met people like Kent Justice, who's on the on the call here today, which is cool. Um, he was doing the program at the time. We got introduced and I said, look, we're going to Japan to watch some rugby. Um, be cool if we can catch up. And um, he ended up posting, he came to one of the games. I think it was the first rugby game he'd ever been to. Um, we went out for dinner a couple of times. And the following year, I said, look, the Rugby World Cup is coming up. Um, I'm bringing my two brothers and 18 friends. Do you think we could organize another dinner? Kent did that. And that was another little, you know, kind of productive accident that everyone is, you know, still talks about how great that dinner, dinner was. And, you know, just having these connections and collaborations. And this is on the fun side. OK, so that's what's happening um, outside of work. But then a lot of these things I end up bringing back into work. So, for instance, people I meet at Creative Mornings, I've brought them in to speak at events uh, internally to city and that opens people's minds to you know the power of stories for instance or um, why drawing or being visual is good for business um, all these other other um, different sort of aspects to creativity that you don't normally come across in a, in a banking situation um, but parallel to all of this and maybe it started actually when I was in Singapore um, my parents brought a biography of a woman from Australia who had gone to Tanzania and started a school in 2002 that fights poverty through education. And it was during the financial crisis. And I, I read this book on holidays and it opened my mind to, you know, the, the power of, of 
um, just this perspective of, okay, share prices are going to zero, but here's someone that is over there that's helping lift children and their families and the whole community out of poverty. Um, and I, I re wrote to the founder after I'd finished re reading the book, I didn't think she would read the email or, or even see it or reply, but it was like I just sent you guys a WhatsApp and it came straight back. And uh, we started this conversation we'd never met before, but um, you know, my family, we sponsored a child. Um, we got on the newsletter and she said, well, look, I'm going back to Australia to do a speaking tour because you know, 90% of her, her funding was coming from uh, donations over there. And I just reached out and said, look, you got to fly somehow via Asia. Why don't you come via Singapore, um, stay with us, and we'll put on a bunch of events. I've got a friend who left finance. He's just got an art gallery. We did two events. Um, in the, you know, that, that week in the evening, we had three international schools that we could connect her to and um, colleagues at work. And the reaction she got was amazing because, you know, here's someone that's really making a big difference. By that stage, she'd gone from three children to 1,100 children. Now she's at about 1,800. Um, and what was cool about that whole adventure is that we'd never met before, but she stayed with us and, you know, obviously become lifelong friends. And it made me realize that, you know, we were spending a lot of money to learn stuff that we kind of already knew, you know, like marketing, statistics, economics, they're not totally unfamiliar if you've done undergraduate, but, you know, maybe we could donate $100 each across all of the, the different platforms, you know, Chicago, London, et cetera. And we could actually sponsor, I worked out the math, we could sponsor two five-year-olds um, right through to 18 in a one-off donation. And I'm pretty sure that'd be kind of powerful. Um, so yeah, there's some of the examples and I'm gonna let Aslam sort of add some comments here because I'm sure there might be some other little tangents that he wants to jump onto, but that's yeah, a taste wow. of some of the productive accidents. Amazing. So, so, so Peter, this is an amazing story you have shown. I mean, it's a collection of 10 years of all your, your meetups and, um, and and, and, and I still remember you talking about St. Jude's when we were doing our program uh, and you shared that story as well. So I think this is quite, quite amazing. But, um, you know, Peter, so I think, you know, one of the things uh, many of us, uh, I'm sure some of us in this group might be wondering, um, to write a book, uh, it's really not, yet, not that easy. Uh, I, I thought about it myself. I've not really gone into writing a book. And I'm sure some of the, uh, the audience here might be curious about how did you start the whole process of writing a book? Perhaps we, you could share that, that piece of journey uh, that yeah. you took. Well, first of all, I actually did go to one of these cre uh, General Assembly events and there was a guy there who kind of described how he reverse engineered writing a book and it made a big difference on me and, and it might help people here as well. And he just said, look, you say you want to write a book and you want it to be 100 pages long and you set a target. You say, look, I want to finish it in 100 days. So by definition, that means you just need to write one page a day. And, you know, obviously you're going to have time for editing beyond that. But that inspired me to think about, um, you know, maybe I could do that, fit it in before work, after work, during lunch, you know, commute, whatever. And um, then Craig Waltman, who was a professor of entrepreneurship at Chicago at the time, spoke at a, a city webinar and He'd written a book called What Is Your Story? And I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, I, I should buy that. And I read it on the way to, or the introduction on the way to work. Three sentences really jumped out. You know, stories are your most valuable asset, more important than facts. If you don't write them down, they did not happen. And those three things also influenced me about, you know, um, wanting to write a book potentially. And um, what I, I actually realized that within four or five years of living in Hong Kong, I had enough content to write a book. In fact, I remember speaking at General Assembly and I, I did uh, some drawings on a napkin that describe, you know, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. Then we built a house in Japan or we, we bought a Vespa after going to Paris and then, you know, then it led to all these other adventures. Um, and I thought, you know, the, the core ideas actually haven't changed. I've had the material for six years. So it is hard to go from that raw idea to finishing because it ends up being, you almost have too many examples once you embrace this idea of productive accidents but i met people along the way and stayed alert to technology that i could use so i used vellum software v-e-double-l-e -E, sorry u-m and what's good about that is it enables you to self-publish and you press you know create digital books and within 30 seconds it creates seven different digital formats kindle apple google etc 
And then I built my own website and I realized, well, actually, I don't need to use Amazon. You know, people can, I can create my own uh, shop. So peterbwilliams.com, you know, I, I only built that in the last few months. And I've learned as much from that experience as anything that I've done in you know, the last 10 years because, you know, I've, I've paid money through PayPal. I've never received money, you know, and then suddenly you can set up Stripe and Apple Pay and Pay Me and FPS and even Octopus. People have bought my book on Octopus. Wow. So... I mm -hmm. treat this whole thing as a, like a minimum viable product and I'm continuously learning. In fact, the book is like an invitation to what should happen next. You know, here's okay. what's happened so far. I hope someone reads it and says, oh, you should meet X, Y, or Z, and that'll turn into another series of adventures. Nice, nice. Well, it seems like you have put all the, all your skills, all the skills you have learned in Chicago Booth to practice minimum viable products start with one. I like the idea of starting with one page, um, you know, one page per day. I think it's uh, it's small enough to start, easy enough to start, and not too daunting. So before yeah, we go, the way, the way, one other thing to think about is if you've got ten insights about if you've got a book title or a theme, and you've got ten insights, then it's just a matter of packing examples around that, which is exactly how I've written the book, inspired okay. by a guy called Austin Cleon. He's written three books: Steal Like an Artist, Show Your Work, Keep Going, and it's exactly that formula. And I went, well, you know what? I could do that. And so I bet you, you guys could too. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just looking at the time and we want to get our audience, uh, you know, to jump in and ask questions. But before that, um, you, you know, to write a book um, like what you did, you know, and, and, and it's not easy. I saw the book. It's, it's actually a collection of uh, many different stories coming together and you're trying and you, act, and you connected all the dots, right? Because all the different productive accidents leading to the next one. Um, you know, there must be a purpose behind this. So what, what is your purpose behind this book? What do you hope to achieve by writing this book? Well, what I kind of discovered was, yeah, sure, this approach can, can lead to innovation and, and creativity. But what I really sort of embrace is this idea that you can turn your life into, you know, this adventure, you know, and the more that what you do outside of work and what you do inside converge, work evaporates, right? It, it all becomes just this playful experiment. And that's why I like, you know, the Lean Startup approach, which I only discovered after moving to Hong Kong. Someone gave me a copy of it. And what it does is turn entrepreneurship into a science. You know, you have a hypothesis of what your clients might like. You build an experiment. Hopefully it only costs you $1 or less. And you, you know, iterate. And what's great about it is it gives you permission not to be perfect. Because the normal way, you know, maybe we're all perfectionists. We'd want to spend every last cent on, you know, making this product launch as, as perfect as possible. But there's a benefit to doing these A-B testing and, and running, you know, these beta programs and getting it out there and letting people interact because eventually you'll end up pivoting into something that is, you know, you wouldn't have come up with on your own if you didn't let these people engage with your product. Okay, great. So we do have one question, but it's more, it's, it's really something you can type in the group chat. So Peter, if you can see, uh, Veronique uh, asked the question, what's the name of the software again? So if you have, sure. you won't mind just put that in uh, but i'd like to perhaps at this point uh open up the the conversation to the panelists and bring the panel bring all the attendees in as panelists so that they can ask you questions directly so uh to all the attendees here if you could just um bear with us a bit lenora can you um elevate all the attendees into panelists and in that way we can see who the uh see who all the participants uh, in this chat and you can ask your questions to Peter directly. Feel free to show your show a video of yourself. By the way, I'd like to take this opportunity to also uh, do a shout out uh, to let you know that Julie Morton, she's, uh, she's in the call. So Julie, I'm not sure if you want to uh, Say a few words before we, as Lenora is bringing everybody up, is you know to be a panelist. Sure, sure, Aslam. I'm happy to. Thank you, Peter. This is wonderful. It's great to see you, and it's wonderful to hear about your book, which I have read and really, really um, enjoy enjoyed, and think that your core message about engaging with people who are different from you and engaging with people that you might not have otherwise connected with. Um, is such, such, such an important one, especially today. Um, 
as I've, as I've, I'm certainly not new to Booth. I've been at Booth for a long time and know many of you from my tenure in career services and corporate relations. But this role leading the executive MBA program, um, it's been a wild ride, needless to say, a program that's predicated on global mobility. And I think your core message of making sure that you're open to meeting people from all walks and connecting them into your network, into your community, is really a, a core of our success, is really a key message of our success. So thank you for being here and for reinforcing that and for reinforcing that we can get together with large groups of people and have good conversations, whether we can be in person or not. It's a valuable message. Wonderful. Thank yeah, you so no, much, Julie. Great. And I, I just think that, you know, the way that Chicago designed our classes were also, you know, with the productive accidents in mind, we've got doctors, we've got journalists, we've got, you know, oil and gas engineers, we've got all these different people coming together. And so that's why I think the new venture challenge is so powerful as well, because you can have these productive accidents during your experience. But in what, in my case, I guess I've just taken that beyond the alumni network um, and in, into any work of life, whether it's volunteering for NGOs and becoming going on the board of one in New York and then coming back and joining one in Hong Kong, you know, it's, it's easy to say, look, let's help people that are in, you know, extreme poverty, but what about helping people in your community as well? And so I've discovered a lot of really powerful NGOs, including one called Impact Hong Kong, where a guy just started a blog about kindness and that turned into kindness walks, which turned into helping the homeless. And now he's, he's got this, you know, kitchen where he's helping people. He's, he's lifted 200 people off the streets of Hong Kong, giving them their dignity back and giving them a chance to, you know, rebuild their lives. Things like that, you know, are, are really give me the energy to think, you know, we've got to keep these, these experiments going. And I really like how, you know, you do one collaboration, say, with Aslam. Then we, I do a collaboration with Julie. If they converge somehow, which often they do, then you get this compound collaboration. So, you know, compound interest is, is magic, but compound collaboration, I think, goes to another level. Brilliant. Like the word compound collaboration. So, um, great. So, Lenora has elevated everyone to be panelists. Um, not all are showing your face. Don't be shy. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Daniel. I see Daniel Chia. I see Kelvin Chu. Uh, I saw Andy for a moment. So, if I could get everyone to just uh, show your show your face for your photo it's nice to see uh, familiar friends and and you know we are all boobies um if you have a question uh, just raise a hand i'll call your name out and you can ask peter directly so who wants to start asking your the first question okay kelvin off you go kelvin chu everyone um uh, hi, uh, just just wondering, you know, were there moments of time when you had uh, wanted to give up on writing the book? And what do you do to motivate yourself to complete it? And also, uh, how much time on average did you actually spend writing every day? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. question. And for sure, I, I did sort of think this is ridiculous. Why would I want to do this? It, you know, it's, it, no one's really going to care. The usual, the usual sort of doubts and things creep in. But I discovered um, a guy called Seth Godin, who's a marketing guy out of New York, um, through Productive Accident. I read a book by Derek Sivers, and I researched who had published that book, and it turned out to be Domino Printing, which is controlled by Derek Sivers, sorry, by Seth Godin. And I went on to his newsletter, and he's been writing blogs for 20 years or something. Sometimes it's a sentence, sometimes it's a paragraph, etc. And he's always encouraging people just to ship their work, get it out there. You know, not everyone's going to like it. But, you know, ignore that. Just find the people that it resonates with and, you know, build momentum that way. Um, I did his Alt MBA, which alternative to an MBA about five years ago, which is like a one month writing workshop. And um, that gave me, again, I did it because I could see there's 100 people converging around the world to do this one month leadership program. And surely there's going to be some productive accidents through that. You meet like minded people, it turns into collaborations, etc. Then, you know, I've always been saying, look, this book feels like it's just an all-nighter away from getting it finished. You know, one all-nighter, I reckon I could get it done. But it never got finished. And then this year, I joined another one of his programs. There's now 4,000 alumni from that Alt-MBA, and they're all self-organizing around, you know, how do you create a podcast? How do you tell better stories? How do you, you know, finish your projects? 
And the one I did this year is called the Creatives Workshop. And it's about creating a 100 day streak in whatever you are trying to finish. And so, for example, if you're a poet, pick up your pen and write a poem every day. If you're a musician, pick up your guitar, write, you know, compose something. In my case, if I picked up my laptop and wrote for, for you know, five minutes a day, five minutes always turns into 10 or 20 or 30. And um, I literally had a piece of cardboard beside the bed where I did a 10 by 10 grid. And every day I picked up a laptop, I fill, filled in a dot and I filled in 100 dots. And that's what enabled me to finish the book. It just gave me that structure and that discipline. Plus you've got other people sort of encouraging you, you know, you've got this cohort of people trying to get, you know, finish their projects. So mm. yeah, I would highly recommend that, that program, yeah. the Creatives Workshop. Great. So Veronique uh, has her hands raised and I think she has also posted a question. Veronique, you want to go for it? Uh, you are muted. You need to unmute. Yes. Hello. I'm wondering uh, uh, what is the sort of the, the time when your ideas, because I, what, what you describe, I mean, I've been living like this uh, most of my life, you know, going from one thing, meeting people and having projects. I mean, what project, but people asking me to do something, write a book, to give a talk, that sort of thing. But um, somehow I've never turned anything into a, a business really myself, you know, I mean, set up saying, okay, I want to do this and make money out of it. And I mean, I've done some things like this, but it's just, I, I have so many ideas, so many different things I could do. And I end up doing nothing really. I mean, not nothing, but I mean, not yeah, being no, no, no. proactive. And I wonder, you know, if there's something about it that you could um, say. Something about? About, um, well, at, at what makes you uh, focus? You know, when you, you have this adventure all the time, I mean, it's fun yeah. too. And you go from yeah. one adventure to another adventure. And when do you decide to focus on one project and what for and why, you know, and is it, is it because you, at some point you decide you want to do this or is it because somehow you've been asked to do it or what? No, it's, it's all um, an experiment, right? It's an evolving collection of experiments and, and, you know, it gets to the point where you get a tipping point, your network becomes so diverse that it doesn't matter who you meet you can either help them directly or you know someone that is relevant to them and you're constantly introducing people. And so, you know, I might say, Veronique, you should meet Kent. You're sitting beside each other on the square here. Um, trust me, you guys have something in, in common. Uh, have a chat and, you know, and then you just sit back and you watch, you know, what happens and it's, you know, m nothing might happen, but you get to know people to such an extent that, you know, it, you can build these, these, these insights, I guess, or intuition. Um, for me, getting it down in the book, I'm treating it as literally, you know, version 0, 0.0. I think there's, you know, I stopped writing in April and then there was editing and getting ready to, to print it um, and finished it. it. It was printed in August on the 8th of the 8th, which felt like a good number. And um, I've already got 10 different or 12 different case studies that I could add to the book because I've paid attention to different communities that I've discovered. Actually, COVID has not slowed it down. In fact, it's from, in some ways it's, it's accelerated. So for instance, there's a group in New York called, um, there's a guy called Chris Shembra and he has a, a gathering called uh, Gratitude and Pasta. Normally it's a physical dinner that he cooks in his, you know, his, his apartment, but because of COVID he's taken it onto Zoom. And so I said, look, you do it at 8 p.m. New York time, that's 8 a.m. my time, I'll join for breakfast. And that's turned into a whole bunch of collaborations. Then I, you know, there's people that are producing podcasts and I've been interviewed on some of those. And then I researched them a little bit more and I discovered the House of Beautiful Business out of Berlin, which is a think tank. They normally do a, a gathering in Lisbon each year, but because of COVID, they did 35 pop-ups around the world. So I hosted the one in Hong Kong. I had a friend in Sydney doing that. And eventually that's gonna converge into a trip to Lisbon and meet these people in person. I don't know, I'm just, I, I just think it's, it compounds over time. Um, you know, it's more on the NGO side that I've probably focused on trying to help as much as possible and bring my network to help, you know, the School of Life, uh, sorry, the Music for Life in New York or Resolve Foundation in Hong Kong or the, you know, the, the charity in, in uh, Tanzania or Room to Read and all of these different groups. Um, I don't know if that's answering your question, but there is a, a formula to it. You know, when I see the possibility of something happening, I just try to advance it. Very good. Thanks, Peter. So, so Veronique, uh, you might just want to reach out privately to Ken, see whether you can spark some productive accidents there. 
Uh, Angel, I see your hands up, but before that, Yuri has pinged me to say he wants to ask a question. So if I could get Yuri to go first, then Angel. Yuri? Good evening, everybody. Uh, great to see you. I also enjoy watching Killing Racing right now online. So, uh, Peter, I have a question. Um, while reading the book, I cannot help but notice that uh, you did not talk or mention about the productive incidents at work. So you was referring to the uh, work as like a daytime job, maybe twice or three times, and uh, the rest of the incidents were actually out of the, you know, office environment. Was it done on purpose or uh, the most creative environment is actually out of the office? Or can you please um, comment on that? Yeah, I guess Thanks. my, there's more things, you know, I, I, I'm fairly open about this. Because I've been working in the same treasury role for quite a while, the concepts don't change, right? So, you know, it kind of uses 5% of my, my brain, it feels like, right? So I have to do these other things, otherwise I go a little bit crazy. Um, but I do try and converge. And I say, look, we're in 100 countries worldwide. What do all of these countries have in common, all these cities? You know, they all care about economic uh, activity and, you know, employment and education and the environment and uh, entrepreneurship and, you know, housing, transport, logistics. You know, in my network alone, I've got thought leaders across all those dimensions. All I need to do is reach out to them and say, look, you know, Aslam, you're, you're a thought leader in, in training and development. You know, we'd love to showcase and amplify your work to our clients and, and you know, our global community. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'd love you to be an ambassador of learning and development. Are you interested? I'm pretty sure you'd say yes. You know, and every person on the screen here today, I could make the same, in, same invitation. And then, you know, all we need to do is sit back and say, look, you guys should introduce each other. You know, don't say what you do. Talk about your story, your journey, what you care about, the projects you're working on. And organically, you'll start to collaborate. And all we need to do is sit back and say, look, how can we help? And you might say, look, I really need an introduction to someone at Amazon. I need to know, I'd, I'd love to meet someone who can build a website or who, who can help us raise funding. I could do that in, as, a, as a work activity, but it doesn't fit with any particular business. So what's strange about it is, you know, I tested this at an event in Sydney and I said, look, how many people would buy a particular sh stock at the moment? You know, out of 50 people, five people put their hand up. So 10% of the people. And I said, okay, let's imagine that we just launched this ambassador program and all this optionality is about to get created. How many people would consider buying that stock now? And it went to 50% of the room. So, you know, the sentiment to purchase a stock, which is kind of useful if you're trying to impress, you know, your investors and shareholders and stuff. You know, to me, there's a lot of power in this stuff, but you have to trust the process and wait for the magic to happen. People often say, look, how will this generate revenue right now? Like this week, this quarter, this, you know, this year, you're like, well, I don't know if it will, but I'm pretty sure it will because you guys will just start collaborating organically and value will be created. And it's kind of like the iPhone, right? The iPhone was pretty cool when it first came out, you know, but then they built this infrastructure inside it, which unleashed everybody else's creativity, which is the app store. They didn't know that a billion apps were going to get created. They just created the conditions, you know, for this ecosystem to evolve. So to me, that's where some of these ideas about productive accidents could be turned into a day job as well. Yeah. Thank you. Why I asked this question, sorry, Aslam, just a quick one. You referred to the give and take book in your book. So, and the idea of the give and take book is actually the reciprocity rings. And um, the author in, of this book, he is actually arguing about engaging the work environment uh, for the special gatherings where you basically ask the question and uh, give the, receive the help in advance. And I think the, you know, the, the whole idea was actually to engage both work and, uh, you know, um, extracurricular activities. That's why I asked this question. Yeah, no. It was interesting to... It's important. I mean, you know, a lot of companies are so inward looking. I think they're missing a lot of opportunities to just look into their communities and see how they can they can help. I mean, there's a big purpose movement right now and how that can become a competitive advantage. So John Wood, who wrote the forward to my book, his most recent book is called Purpose Incorporated. And it's about how, you know, if a company has a purpose beyond, you know, traditional returns, et cetera, it can be a competitive advantage because suddenly, you know, the staff are more engaged, they're more loyal, they're more creative, they're more productive, everything else fits together. Um, and you can think of examples of that around the world, you know, probably like Patagonia and, and places like that. 
Um, so yeah, I think there is relevance to bridging the gap between you know hardcore ROI and and bigger you know a bigger definition of that. Um, and you know m in my case, if I look back and say, look, this has been an amazing adventure, and you know and you have no regrets, then I think that's a good outcome as well. And you know you could say that a lot of this is powered by a midlife crisis that doesn't quit sort of thing. You know, like for sure, why do we do the MBA? Because we're sort of not quite satisfied. You know, we think. If I do this, maybe it'll help me go to another level. That's great. All right. I just want to bring Angel now into the conversation. Angel, your hand is raised. Um, hi, thank you. Uh, so this is actually Will Chow. Um, um, Will a couple Chow, of but her. I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I was wondering, uh, right, Angel? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. A couple of us got together to, for a mini watch party. So uh, <laughs> we're actually watching uh, watching uh, the, this the session together. <laughs> um, so, Go for it. Peter, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it seems like there's an element of being spontaneous uh, during your entire adventure. So I'm kind of curious, um, how do you kind of manage uh, to be like the balance between being spontaneous as well as having purpose during your journey while ensuring that your longer terms are kind of met, your longer term goals are met? Yeah, I mean, I guess I've got enough data to say that, look, 80 or 90% of these experiments turn into something I think useful and valuable and, and worthwhile. So that's why I don't hesitate anymore. Maybe at the start, I, I was reluctant to become the tennis captain or to speak at events. Like I spoke at the Asia Corporate Innovation Summit in Jakarta a couple of years ago. And, you know, I met people that have become lifelong friends. And so it's, to me, it's, it's a no brainer to embrace these things. Um, even through LinkedIn, you know, I've got probably a hundred conversations that have gone on and, you know, the, the, dis the decision is quite easy. People that reach out and say, Hey, looks like we've got some shared interest. Do you want to have a chat? I'll always say yes to that. The people that copy in six, six paragraphs of stuff and expect me to click on a link and buy something, there's, there's no way. Right. So, that's something people might want to think about. Um, and, you know, some of these conversations where you can tell, let's, let's set up a WhatsApp call. It's half an hour. I pretend I have 15 appointments per week where I can have these opportunities or gateways to productive accidents, you know, early morning before work. I don't sleep as much as I probably should, um, you know, quick lunch after work. Hong Kong also enables us, I have to say, like I can, I've literally gone to three events on the way home from work. You know, and I don't think you could do it that in any other, other city. I tried it in New York. You couldn't be uptown, downtown, midtown, and, you know, and expect to get to each, each event. Um, but one, you know, productive accident, there's a guy called Greg Larkin. He wrote a book called This Might Get Me Fired. We, we set up a call. It's about corporate innovation. We got on really well. I said, you know what? One of the traditions that's described in the book is if people are coming to Hong Kong, I always say, look, don't stay in a hotel stay at our place. And the benefit of that is we get to hang out. You get to live a little bit like Hong Kong. Um, the, the magic is when I'm not there, my children get exposed to people from different you know, careers and different walks of life. So in one month, we had a documentary filmmaker from LA. We had a musician from Melbourne. We had a Maasai tribal dude from Tanzania. And you know, to me, that has become a tradition that our family now embraces. Um, so I had a call with that guy, Greg Larkin, and we got on well. I said, look, you need to come out here and, and stay with us and do a speaking tour. Next thing you know, I was on the way to New York for a different reason. I had volunteered. No one else in this training program had volunteered to go on a panel um, for a program internally. I thought it was going to be in Philippines or Singapore or something. But it turns out they needed someone in New York. I said, yeah, I can do that. I'll go over there for a week. And I ended up staying with this guy in Brooklyn. And he gave me, you know, the teenage punk rock tour of his youth. And now I'm in a, a, a sort of an entrepreneur's club that he hosts every two weeks called Punks and Pinstripes. And term goals, I assume talking about, you know, when do I retire type thing or, you know, like I'm assuming we're all gonna live to 120. So I just turned 50. So I've got, you know, 50 years to play and then I'll slow down maybe. Wow, Peter. You know, as you're talking about the amount of uh, networking that you do, it just boggles the mind. And uh, what comes to mind is how do you manage this, you know, your time, your energy, uh, as you do all these connections and, and networking? Uh, I play a lot of tennis and I play a lot of everything. I, I you know, um, I think 
you know, 100%, there's no way I could have done the MBA. There's no way my wife and I would both be working. There's no way we'd have four children. There's no way we'd be traveling and all this if it wasn't for our, you know, our helper, Ivy from Philippines, who's been with us for 15 years. So we do have a bit of a competitive advantage living in Asia, you know, like if, if we went back to Sydney, that wouldn't happen. You know, you don't, you don't, you're paying professional wages for that sort of thing here. You, you know, I don't know if it's a, a good thing or a fair thing or, or what, but you know, we we treat uh, Ivy like some, you know, someone in the family. Her sister used to live with us in Singapore. My children have been flower girls and page boys and that for their weddings and stuff. So, you know, that's that's one thing that's enabled. It's why I, I wanted to do the fundraising for the Helper documentary because it was a way of amplifying appreciation for their sacrifice. And that's what the whole point of that movie was. And it was a collaboration between a Hungarian guy that I met through Clock and Flap, which is a music festival here, and a British filmmaker. And, um, you know, I helped do the, the Kickstarter. And that was a learning experience as well. I didn't realize Kickstarter is all or nothing. It's like, you know, you say the budget's 85,000 US, you get to 84,000. And if you don't quite get the target, it all unwinds. But, you know, long story short, a guy from the tennis team helped get over the line, you know, a hedge fund guy. So anyway. There's lots of stuff that has, has happened, you know, and you spoke about um, Give and Take, which is Adam Grant. Another book that's great is called The Go-Giver. And it's about, you know, this idea of helping people without expecting anything in return. You know, over time, eventually, maybe I want someone to buy my book or someone to promote my book and everyone wants to help each other. It comes around, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, we have a few more minutes before we end and I just wanted to ask uh, everyone, you know, if you have any more questions, maybe a few of you can just raise your hands, you capture a few questions and then uh, we can do a wrap up. Any more questions from, from the audience? Anyone? You can just unmute and ask if you, have, if you don't know how to raise the hands in the, in the Zoom chat. Peter, thank you very much for the presentation. This was really inspiring. Uh, I want to, I'm just curious, uh, how do you keep in touch with people? You meet so many people, but then uh, how do you make sure that, you know, they, are, they don't face out of your circle after some time? So it's a, that's a great question because, you know, the typical way or my, my approach to networking, you know, and I'll go to an event, there might be 100 people. But I, I am literally an introvert. I would much rather have a conversation with a person one-on-one -on -one than to talk to a hundred people. You know, not, I mean, I'm okay talking about stuff I know about like this, but I'd rather get to know someone in depth and, and form a lifelong friendship and, and let that compound over time. And the formula is, look, make a connection with somebody that looks friendly and you know, welcoming and so on. Um, keep talking until you find something you both care about. It could be skateboarding, it could be BMX, it could be snowboarding, it could be a startup, it could be you know creativity, it could be whatever. And once you find that overlap, the next thing is you challenge yourself to collaborate. And it should be easy. You're already energized by whatever that topic was, snowboarding or, or tennis or golf or whatever. And so that forms you know this link. And even if you don't see each other for another three years, you've got that you know cemented into your into your DNA that that conversation will continue. Excellent. Any more questions? Thanks, June. Great question. Thank you. Anyone wants to ask a question? Okay. So, so um, yep, Peter, you were saying? I was just going to say, uh, Linda is on here somewhere. She was. It would be great to get her out here because Linda was great during the program I somehow wow. I decided during the career services activities that you know we're, we're going through these 16 weeks of classes um I don't know what I want to do when I grow up so you know maybe I can you know use her as a sounding board just like Simon Crockett and, and all the other people uh in Julie's world and you know I'd go in there and organize half an hour every class week and it's like well let's talk about this and you know what was great about Linda is that oh yeah you should meet a b and c and some of those people you know, uh, like Steve Stein have become great friends. Steve Stein uh, used to come in and do panelists, you know, panels on headhunting head and uh, preparing for interviews and stuff. Um, we became good friends. He self-published a book, a children's book, which, you know, also plants a seed. Oh, you know, maybe I can do that one day. Um, then he moved to Bali and, you know, we've got this place in Naseko. He's got this thing in Bali. He said, Look, let's do a house swap. And I said, yeah, totally. You know, we've already been the, to the snow at Christmas, Chinese New Year. We went to Bali. He went to Naseko. So that created a, a little bit of fun too. And we already live around the world. Why don't we, you know, part of our retirement plan 
someone's got an apartment in New York, someone's got a place in Niseka, someone's got a place in Paris. Let's just form a little network and, and you know, rotate every three months. I'd do that for a year, for sure. Sounds like a nice uh, retirement plan. So Linda, with that shout out, you have to say something. <laughs> Sure. So, Peter, do you mind if I tell the story of how you sort of began all of this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, my memory might be a little bit different to yours, but let's go with it. <laughs> well, I remember I had Steve Stein on a panel at, uh, at Chicago Booth, and Steve was talking about all the different careers he's had, because he's had many, many different careers, and he had written a children's book. And Peter came into my office after his with his head in his hand saying, I'm so depressed. And I said, why? And he said, oh, Steve's done all these things and I haven't. I said, excuse me, you have a pretty cool job in a pretty cool company. You've done really well. And you said, yeah, but I haven't done all these things. I haven't published a book and, and you've done it now. <laughs> so I don't know if that was the inspiration, but that's how you met Steve Stein. And I remember you yeah. being impressed with him and yeah, uh, you that borrowed much. that children's book and, and went off and talked to him about it. <laughs> Yeah. And the weird thing is, you know, like once you get exposed to, you know, I didn't know what I cared about, right? I guess it became, you know, the school in Tanzania meant, okay, I care about education, which the fact that we're doing an MBA, we care about education. Then I discovered Rinta Reid, you know, John Wood spoke at United World College. And then he moved to Hong Kong. I moved to Hong Kong. We've been collaborating ever since. You know, fast forward, he wrote the forward to my book, which is kind of surreal. You know, it's kind of, kind of come full circle. And uh, he's just sent me a WhatsApp right now. And, you know, he's organizing a hike for tomorrow night or something, you know. So all of these people, you know, you, you try to help each other um, without expecting anything in return. Patrick Ip is another guy from U Chicago. I don't know if you've come across him, Julie. He, um, you know, did, I think, Polsky. While he was an undergrad, he started, a, um, he did a startup that was purchased before he even graduated. So he's an ultra high achiever. He created a thing called Baller Dinners, which is amazing. I don't know if you've heard of it, but I've been hosting them ever since I hosted him. I prepared him for his TED Talk in Hong Kong about seven years ago. And the whole mindset is, you know, tell me your story. Tell me what projects you're working on and how can I help? You know, that offer of help is unfamiliar to a lot of people. Like, you know, why are you doing that? It it's sort of ca catches people off guard. But now there's about 1,800 people in this community. It's the virtual version of Productive Accidents. So, you know, we've got this within our network. We need to amplify it. Wow, fantastic, Peter. So that's how it all started. Huh? Thanks, Linda, for sharing that insight. <laughs> okay, um, you know, I'm just looking at the time. It's 8 o'clock. Um, and I was thinking before we end, does anyone have any questions? Uh, and I also wanted to ask if, you know, before we end, we get a group shot of everyone. Uh, Lenora can help take a group shot. So before that, any more questions? If not, then we can move towards the wrap-up. Anyone has any questions? Oh, I see Angel finally appearing. <laughs> okay, nice. Uh, that's nice. And Andy, okay, that's great. So if not, um, can we just get everyone to switch on your, switch on your, your cameras? Uh, let's just do a great group shot. There's so many people here. We want to remember uh, who's on and perhaps at the, before we, the end of the night or before the end of the week, spark some productive accidents. So I just want to check into the next page. Great. Uh, okay. The other thing is once you give people the vocabulary, the vocabulary of productive accident makes people realize, oh yeah, that's how I got that job or how I met my, my, you know, my husband or wife or, you know, whatever. So they are out there. It's just people probably haven't given them the, the, the time to acknowledge. That's great. So, um, Okay, so I still see a few in the second page not switched on, if you don't mind uh, switching on. And uh, Lenora, whenever you are ready, you just give a shout out and then we can 